place, God. This is the very time, oh God, where we're not distracted, God, where you can come in and have your way, God. Have your way even now, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we say yes to your will, God. We say yes to your way. We say yes, we shall obey. So come no more and have your way, God, and reign in this place. Honor our sacrifice. Honor, I got our desire and our hunger and our thirst after you in the mighty name of Jesus. We got up early, God. Oh, God, on a time, oh, God, that was not our normal time. But, God, you got up early in the morning, and you were already at work doing what you were uh, uh, ordained and commanded to do. That was to be life to the people, to be an encourager unto the people, to be the light that we need in this dark and dying world. Thank you for getting up. Thank you for the victory that came with you getting up. Thank you for rising from the dead, oh God, with all power in your hands. We bless your name, God, and we glorify you this day. Now let the words of my mouth, God, and the meditations of my heart, God, I desire for them to be acceptable in thy sight. But Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray this morning. Amen and amen. Come on, let's put our hands together and let's make some noise for Jesus on this morning for he got up. Hallelujah. With all power in his hands. Hallelujah. We magnify you, God. We glorify you and we bless your name this day. Turn week with me quickly as we so often do when we preach. Don't want you to sit down and have to get back up for the reading of the word again. Turn with me to John chapter 20, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 10. Crystal this morning read uh, Matthew's account of the resurrection. But I want to take this morning's message from John's account. John chapter 20, beginning reading at verse 1, verses 1 through 10. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. When it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came unto the sepulchre. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again and unto their own home. This is the word of God. Let all the people say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord on this morning. In our scripture text this morning, before I even get into the message, I thank God for um, this a sunrise service in this uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday. Um, as I look back on last year, um, last year, um, if I'm not mistaken, according to what the videos told me, last year we had Resurrection service in my living room. Um, I believe that we were in transition from um, the uh, school, um, preparing to enter into this building, and the building was not yet ready for us to enter in into the building. And so we um, had closed out our contract with the school, and uh, as God had commanded us that wherever he told us to lay that tent and lay that, uh, that altar uh, and lay that ark is where he wanted us to have service at. And so on Resurrection Sunday of 2015, we were in a, a living room, my living room, um, uh, celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But I thank God today that that is not so, that we're not in my living room this morning, but that we are in our own temple, our own place of worship. And I thank God. That's God is worthy of praise. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for newness. And that's a good thing. I had a desire. We hoped last year that we could possibly be in here in the sanctuary, uh, in the church on Resurrection Sunday. But we had to wait a couple of more weeks for that to happen. And I thank God for um, what he has done in just a year's time. And so in our scripture text this morning, we read John's account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
and I won't be before you long. I do have a time limit that I want to stick to this morning. Now, other accounts of the resurrection can also be found in Matthew 28, 1 through 10. That's what Crystal read this morning. In Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, and in Luke 24, uh, verses 1 two, through 12. I want you all to take time to read through those because those accounts, they vary a little bit, and you can tell the difference in the, uh, in the storytelling of the different writers. The accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were from the third person. They, weren't, they didn't have a first-person experience with Jesus in his resurrection at the tomb. Um, but John's uh, uh, account is from the first person. Uh, he, he didn't hear uh, the news from someone else. Mary Magdalene came and told them that Jesus' body was not there, but they actually went to go see. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account, they only heard what, what they were told from Mary and what they heard from John and from Peter's account. And so their accounts are, uh, they leave out some details that are in there uh, that I want to highlight uh, on or focus on this morning. And so in John's account, uh, it's from the first person experience, from hearing the news from uh, the Marys, uh, the both Marys, Mary Magdalene, the woman with the seven demons that uh, Jesus had evicted out of her, or cast out of her, and the other Mary. And oftentimes we don't know what the, who the other Mary is. I, I thought at times that the other Mary was um, Jesus' mother, but um, as I did my research today, the other Mary was actually the mother of James and John. That was the woman who actually went um, uh, to the tomb with Mary Magdalene. Magdalene. Now, y'all know who that other Mary was. That other Mary was the one that came to Jesus and asked Jesus, can her son sit on the sides of him, on one on the left and one on the right of, with him uh, when he uh, returns back unto heaven? And so this Mary was fully acquainted with who Jesus was. And they did as what the women would do or were accustomed to do in those days. They were went to the, the tomb to uh, bring a, a, a pour incense over the body of those that had passed away because they didn't want them to stink and they didn't want them to go up into glory uh, with uh, foulness on their bodies. So they sanctified the bodies by putting incense upon um, the bodies. And so they came and, and saw as they enter in or they came to the tomb, they, uh, they it's amazing that they went in the first place because they didn't have a way to be able to get the stone removed from uh, uh, the, 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 the burial place. Uh, the, the tomb had been sealed. The king had sealed the tomb, uh, so at least the men had, the, the, the Israel, I mean, the Jews had sealed the tomb uh, so that they wouldn't be able to say that Jesus rose. So it took something supernatural to remove that tomb or remove that headstone from the tomb uh, so that Jesus would be able to um, exit the tomb and, and, and rise according to what he said, according to his word. And so uh, they came to the tomb and seeing the linen's clothes laying without a body, uh, uh, John and Peter did. And within one week, it appears that their worlds had been completely turned upside down. They entered into Jerusalem. If you think of their entering and their journey, um, as we talk about this first day of the week, it was Sunday. But just a week prior, they were just entering into uh, Jerusalem triumphantly. They were coming uh, uh, triumphantly into Jerusalem, celebrating the coming of the king. But within a week, their world had been turned upside down. They were on cloud nine when they entered in uh, to Jerusalem because the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God. God in the highest. They were magnifying the name of Jesus as he entered in uh, to Jerusalem, being led by their master, Jesus. And the time was now at hand would, uh, they, they foresaw, they foresaw, I want you all to get this, uh, of the emptying of the tomb and the importance of the emptying of the tomb and the importance of the trials of their week. Now, they entered in expecting themselves to be able to take over Jerusalem. That's what they thought that the, the Messiah was come to do. The Messiah was come to restore power back to the Jews over Jerusalem, that they would be able to uproot the, uh, the pagan people, the Romans, oh God, and get them out of Jerusalem. And so they felt that it was now the time. Now, not only did they have the man that was uh, had this power, this miraculous power, he was doing miracles signs and wonders, but now the people are backing him as well. And so they thought that it was now time to wrest control of Jerusalem from their Roman captors. And they did this according to their misinterpretation of the word. And so in Micah chapter 5 and 2, it states, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among thousands of Judah, 
Yet out of thee shall come forth unto thee, uh, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. And so the scripture says that uh, a, a, a king would come from uh, the small little old city of Bethlehem, and he would come uh, uh, and be able to be the ruler over Israel. This is what they were uh, uh, believing in because they had a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of the word. They were thinking in, them, in themselves with their flesh and not with their spirit. And so they were going by what the scripture says, that this king would come, this ruler would come from Bethlehem, whose going forth will be something like those of the men of old. And, and, and if you all remember the scripture where Peter, where Jesus asked the disciples, who does men think that I am? Who do they say that I am? He says, some say Isaiah, some say Elijah, but Peter, who was anointed by the Holy Spirit to declare, you are the son of the living God. And so they knew that he was somebody of old and somebody he had characteristic of the fathers of the prophets of old. And so in Isaiah as well, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, it states, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of the, his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. If you got, if you remember, the Jews were uh, ritualistic in their readings of the law and the readings of the prophets. And so they meditated on his word uh, both day and night, but they didn't have clear understanding of his word. But as they understood his word, Jesus fulfilled every one of those descriptions um, that the prophet Isaiah just declared. The spirit of wisdom and understanding was upon him. He was able to expound upon the word like no one else. He, he, was a, he had the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might. He spoke with authority. He spoke with power. Um, they said that he spoke with authority at the age of 12 when he was ministering in the temple at the age of 12, uh, the, um, talking to them about the word of God. They couldn't understand how a 12-year-old could know so much about the word and how he can speak with under so much authority and power, even at such a young age. So he had power and might in his words. And when he came, he didn't judge people according to his eyes. Um, the Jews, they judged people according to what they saw. If you weren't a part of the Jewish heritage, you were a, a, a vagabond. You were a foreigner. You were a castaway. You had no right to enter into the temple, nor did you have any right to fellowship with them. They judged people according to what they looked like. There were different layers and levels that you can get to of authority and of favor. Uh, that If you weren't in the in crowd, then that means you were on the outside and no one really dealt with you. And so they judged people by their eyes, but Jesus... He was no respecter of person. He went to go eat with anyone that invited him in to sup with him. He came and had fellowship with him. He came in fellowship with Zacchaeus. He came in fellowship with Matthew, the tax collector. People that were uh, the scourge of the land, Jesus was willing to fellowship with them. So he didn't judge the poor. He didn't judge them according by what he saw, but he judged people according to the contents of their heart and of their characters. And so after centuries of being ruled, by the Gentiles, outcasts uh, that were from the lineage of the kings of old and not privy to the covenant of the father of Abraham. The scripture as they perceived it was now being fulfilled as the king had returned to Jerusalem to, make his, to take his rightful place and regain the crown for the Jews. It says in the, in the scriptures that we do on our timeline, the timeline is on our website. It comes in and says that on Monday, he cleaned out the temple. He cleaned out the temple. He, he put some whips together, put some strings, the strands of court together and whipped them out of the temple because they were desecrating the temple with uh, uh, m the money changers. They had turned their, the, uh, the house of the Lord into a den of thieves. So, so he cleaned out. He showed his authority and he showed his power on Monday by cleaning out the temple. And then he displayed his authority 
authority over those spiritual things by cleaning out the temple. Then on Tuesday, he cursed the fig tree. He showed that he um, had authority over earthly things as well. And he, uh, he rebuked the um, fig tree because it did not have, it was not bearing the fruit um, that he expected to be bearing or uh, born on uh, that tree. So he cursed it and he showed or displayed his power over earthly things on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, he gave them a new Passover ritual. Instead of uh, uh, having to slay the lamb anymore, he told them that as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me and the sacrifice that I would do for you um, in the next couple of days. And so they were on cloud nine. Uh, it was now uh, or never for them. Uh, the Pharisees couldn't stop them. The Sadducees couldn't stop them. The people were now on their side. And so they were ready to take over Jerusalem again and return it back into their rightful hands. And that's how confident they were on Thursday. Uh, but on Friday morning, their confidence was shaking. Uh, life as they once knew it was now gone. They entered in Thursday victorious, but they left out Friday morning saddened and scattered and uh, 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 people hated them and uh, 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 they were scattered, discouraged, fearful of their lives and they were running on empty. They were running on empty. And so I just want you to have that in your mind, that they were running on empty. So what do you do when you find yourself running on empty? When everything, the, the foundations that you believe in, the, the things that you had foresaw and that you thought of um, were, were, were not what they really were. And you found yourself in a state of uh, discontent, uh, a disarray, discouragement. What do you do when you find that you are running on empty? Empty can be defined as this, and I know all of us understand hopefully what empty is. You can see it as um, an example for those that like to drink um, out of coffee cups. If there's no more coffee in the cup, that means your cup is empty. But the, the dictionary gives us this definition of empty. I empty can be defined as containing nothing having none of the usual or appropriate contents. A cup, a water cup has no more water. A soda cup has no more soda. Um, a plate has no more food. Those are the usual or appropriate contents for an item. But, but empty can also be defined as vacant or unoccupied. Uh, it can be defined as without force, effect, or significance. Empty. It can uh, be identified as being destitute of some quality or qualities. Lastly, uh, empty can be uh, identified as being devoid of something of substance. What a difference a day makes. The day before, they were full. They were victorious. They were rejoicing. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Last Supper uh, images that they show you, um, John was laying on uh, Jesus' bosom. Everything was, was peach, I mean, peachy keen. Everything was just all right. But what a difference a day makes. And I'm not here to bash the disciples this morning, but I'm just here to encourage us to understand that when we run on empty, that we can still go to the same person that we went to yesterday and the day before. Jesus is the same today, uh, both now and forever, and we always can go to him. And so I want to identify or, or, or go through the severity of their dilemma and the change, how quickly their situation changed. With the natural eyes, they could not see the glory of God. They could not see anything good in the death of Jesus. And oftentimes we suffer from uh, that same short-sighted mentality. We, we see things and we uh, don't understand why they're going on and why they're happening. And we see that it, it appears that the world is ending, that everything is going wrong uh, because a short-sighted mentality can't see beyond the fire or the trial that's going on in our lives at this time. How many of you have, uh, uh, have had something occur in your life that totally went opposite of the way that you expected it to go and it threw you for a loop. Um, I had an experience back in college where um, I was running for president of my organization. Now, I had um, invested time in that orga organization for a number of years and it appeared that it was my time to take charge of this organization. And as the time came for me to take it, I was confident. Um, I was uh, very confident that I would be um, placed as or installed as a president of this organization. But lo and behold, after uh, the group got together and voted, um, it, 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 it just so happened that um, I was not voted in. I was the most experienced. I was the most, uh, 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 the strongest person to be able to run the organization. But for some reason, the people chose a different person. And it threw me for a loop. It had me discouraged for a number of days because I expected it to turn out a little bit different th than the way it turned out. And so for many of us, 
We run into a corner. What happens when you find when you're discouraged or what what you expect does not occur? Many of us run into corners. Many of us hide ourselves away. Many of us turn our back on those things that we know uh, which is right. And some of us even give up hope. But in spite of what uh, Jesus had told the disciples, uh, they could only see as far as what was in front of their eyes. He told them before that very day on Thursday that uh, his body will be taken, that he will be put up, but he will rise in three days. He told them that already. But uh, hearing those words did not, uh, 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 they didn't come into play after Jesus had been crucified. It did not come into their minds uh, what Jesus had told them. And what is important to know is that when we live in the flesh, when we go by what we see in the flesh, our flesh leads us astray and our flesh does not give us the accurate uh, definition or revelation of what God's word is saying to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible states this, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So if we're not allowing the spirit to lead us uh, in every area of our lives, if we're not allowing the spirit to direct us and instead we're allowing our flesh to uh, give us understanding, then that means that we're not getting the true and full understanding of what God intends in his word. And they had the word. They had the word. They, they knew the law. They knew uh, uh, the prophets. They knew what the word of God was saying, but they were receiving it they were comprehending it they were understanding it with their flesh and not with their spirit and so it doesn't make uh, sense naturally uh, 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 t these things happen when we when we allow them uh, to be understood in the flesh our flesh doesn't comprehend it or does not understand it and so I have these example he examples here it doesn't make sense naturally to hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle when the person is actually in front of me talking all that smack and making all that noise when they're in my face it doesn't make sense for me to hold back naturally but the spirit tells me that the Lord will fight my battle for me it does not make sense when um, the bills are not being paid or not being met and, and you don't you have shortcomings here and there it doesn't make sense to offer God a sacrifice in your finances because you have something that you should be placing that money else into that's what your body is saying but your spirit is saying give unto God because when you give unto God he gives back unto you it does not make sense to us um, naturally when when it appears that everything is working against us how can we have hope when everything appears to be working against us, that's what the spirit man, I mean, that's what the flesh would say. But we must understand today that we walk by faith and not by sight. So that means that what we see cannot be, cannot outweigh, by, I mean, cannot be outweighed by what we know. We must walk by what we know and not by what we see. But the disciples at this time, they were walking in a life of despair, in a life of darkness, because the light of Jesus had been snuffed out right before them. And so it's encouraging to know, or we must be encouraged to know that even when Jesus died, he still was working on our behalf, even in death and in the grave and in hell, he was still fighting a war for us. And even when it appears that he is not with us, God is still with us each and every single day. And so many of us find ourselves running on empty. We have been discouraged. We have been beaten. We have been bruised. We have been scattered. Uh, we have been forsaken, and we find ourselves running on empty. And so how can, we, uh, how can we identify when we're running on empty? How can we identify when we're running on empty? Uh, we can identify a car when it runs on empty. How many of you all have allowed your car to get real close to being empty? I, I know I do it quite often, and I need to stop because they say when you let the car get real empty or get too low, then the little particles start rustling up, and those particles get into your engine and start doing damage. But we can tell, we can identify when a car is running on empty by three things. I have three things here. You can tell that a car is running on empty uh, because the car alerts you. It gives you a little alert or a little notice. Um, back in the day when we were in California, Lady McCowan and I, we had a, 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 a Ford Ranger, a, a big old truck. And when we first bought the car, the car was dinging. The first time we bought the car, we got the car, it was on full. We had dro driven the car back from Fresno all the way down to San Diego. We bought the car in Fresno on a bowling trip, and we drove it all the way down um, back to San Diego. And when we got back to San Diego, uh, the car the, uh, there was a light on um, in, the, in the gauge. 
and we couldn't tell what the light meant. It didn't, it didn't say gas. It just says check meter or check something. And we couldn't comprehend what was going on uh, with the car. So we kept driving for a number of days. We kept driving uh, with this big old red light on the gauge telling us that the car was empty. We finally realized before the car actually cut off is that that car needed some gas. For some reason, we were just so silly. We had two children at that time. I think Diamond and Eric. Yeah, we had two children. So we should have had a little bit more common sense that maybe we need to put some gas in the car. But it was an alert telling us that the gas uh, is running, the car was running on empty. And so the first uh, identification, the first alert to know that you're running on empty is that you will be notify. The second thing that a car does to let you know that you're running on empty is that the car will start sputtering. And I've been in a car that was sputtering and running out of gas, and it just kept sputtering. One moment it'll, it'll go, then the next moment it's stopping. You let it sit there, and then it sputters again, and then it keeps going. And then the last identifying factor of a car that's running on empty is that the car actually stops running. It actually just completely stops and won't start again. And it's amazing that we can be just like cars in our spiritual walk, and when we're empty, uh, the Lord is identifying and letting us know that we are running on empty. There are warning signs to let us know that we're running on fumes, spiritually speaking. And so what, what, which way? How can we identify that we're running on fumes? Well, the first way we can identify that we're running on fumes uh, is that when the word is preached, we're not applying the word. Each and every Sunday and each and every Tuesday and each and every Friday, we come here and the word and the God gives us a word to encourage us. But many of us don't take that word. We don't take that word and run with it. We, we don't take any notes. We, we find ourselves occupied. Something else is on our mind instead of taking the word and applying it. And I want you all to know this, that every time the word of God is, 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 is spoken or preached or declared, it's a word for you. You may not be in that season at that time, but it's a guarantee that God's going to bring you through that season. And that's why he's giving you an opportunity to hear the word of God. Don't allow yourself to uh, be too busy. Don't find yourself thinking about something else uh, when you should be thinking about what God needs you to know in the word that he's giving you. So the first warning that you're wanting empty is that you're not hearing the word of God. And the word of God is the life that we need that will sustain us. The word of God is what will carry us throughout the day. The word of God is what will help us. Just like gas will help in a car, the word of God will help us in our Christian walk. It gives us the strength and the power that we need to continue to run on. And so the second thing that we can identify that shows that we're running on empty spiritually is that our commitment rain, uh, wanes. We don't have the same focus. We don't have the same attention to detail. We don't have the same desire to be in church and to do the things that will help us to grow spiritually. We no longer have the same desire to pray. We no longer have the same desire to read God's word. We no longer have the desire to sacrifice and to give God our best instead of giving God our least and our worst. And so we can, it's okay for us to miss a service or, or not take time to pray early in the morning. It's okay. It's all good. That's a sign for us that we're running on empty. And then the last sign, the third sign that we can identify that we're running on empty is that ministry becomes an afterthought. It goes back and it, it's not uh, important to us. Our ministries, our gifts, our talents, they're not focused. It's not, it's not important for us to be able to put those things um, uh, into play. Prayer becomes an afterthought. I, I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to get up in the morning and go. Then you're running on empty because you're not relying upon the source of our strength. And so I ask you again as I uh, quickly come to my conclusion and, and go further in the word. When you're running on empty, Empty life does not work like it's supposed to work. Just like a car without gas, a person without being filled, a person without uh, attaching himself to God, a person that's not seeking to be in God's presence, you will find yourself ineffective because you don't have what you need to make sure that you're running efficiently and stop and, and not running effectively. And so what do you do when you find yourself running on empty? The scripture gives us some references today on people who were running in empty, but they left filled with what they needed for victory on the next day. And so in verse 1 in John chapter 20, the scripture reads as such, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, 
and see the stone taken away from the sepulcher. The first thing that we need to do when we find ourselves running on empty is that we need to go after God. Mary came early after God. She didn't wait till the end of the day because it says uh, in other uh, variations of this uh, uh, passage, it says that she came early in the morning before the sun had risen. That means before she got busy with anything, before she got uh, hung up with anything else, before she decided to cook breakfast for her husband, before she decided to go clean somebody's house, she took time to run to God. We can't, we can't find ourselves running from God when we're empty because we won't get the satisfaction, we won't get the replenishment that we need. But the first uh, quality, the first thing that we should do when we find or we, when we identify that we're running on empty is that we need to run back to God. We need to be like that deer who is panting after the water book. We need to long after Jesus. We need to long after God. We need to long after his presence. And we need to find ourselves seeking after him early while he may yet be found before our minds get distracted because I don't know about you but when I go through the day um, and, and, and I don't take time to pray and take time to read God's word early then the day goes all the way past I don't got myself caught up at work or caught up with some other stuff and I forget to seek and tap in or, or tap into God and when we forget to seek or tap into God then we're ineffective things don't go the way that we want them to go so the first thing we should do is that do like Mary did she sought Jesus she didn't just take it as an afterthought that he'll be with me forever. But she went running and chasing after him. Mary came to the tomb early in the morning. The second thing that we should do if we find ourselves running on empty is that we need to go tell somebody about Jesus. Don't you know that when we declare how great God is, it does not matter if our life is ex exactly the way that we expect it to be. We can say that God is great and greatly to be praised even when we're lacking strength or we're lacking, uh, or we have, we're hurt in our bodies or we may have lowness in our financial accounts. We still can declare the, how great God is because we understand that our God is great and our God is mighty. And that's what Mary did. When she came to the tomb, Jesus was not there. And so she had a lack or a void there. But that did not stop her from still declaring that Jesus was risen and that he was still alive. So instead of speaking death, instead of saying that somebody took him away and that was the end of the story, Mary went and told somebody about Jesus. When we're down and when we're uh, out and when things are not going our way, we need to speak about the good news of Jesus and declare it in our lives. And it will bring us strength and bring us the encouragement that we need to continue to hold on. She went and she told Peter and the other disciple, John, and let them know that Jesus was no longer in the temple, I mean in the sepulcher. Come see where they laid the Lord. He's not there anymore. Tell somebody about how great God is. The Bible tells us, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So she could have went away satisfied on her own, but instead she wanted to bring somebody in and compel them and let them know and see about the great news of Jesus Christ. A third thing that I want you all to take note that when you're running on empty, that you need to get to Jesus. Stop worrying about others. You have to get to Jesus for yourself. Uh, the scripture tells us that uh, uh, John and Peter, they ran to uh, the sepulcher to go see who Jesus, uh, where Jesus was. Uh, and it just so happened that they both left at the same time, but John beat Peter to the tomb. But John didn't get in. He didn't go into the tomb. But Peter went in. We have to make sure we keep going uh, as full out as we can to make sure that we get to Jesus. Just because somebody else stops at the door, that don't mean that you need to stop at the door. Keep running to him until you get just what you need from the Lord. Don't stop praying. The Bible on the songwriter said, the Lord is nigh. Don't stop praying. He'll answer you by and by. If it seems like you're praying and your prayers are not being answered, don't just stop at the prayer. Keep chasing, keep running after him, keep going after him until you get what you need from the master. He told us that we can call upon him and he'll answer us. When we just need to keep going and chasing after him. So we need to get to him no matter what is happening. You may be sick in your body. Keep getting to Jesus. He may not send you the healing that you need yet, but keep going after him. Keep chasing after him because it's important for us to tap in to the source of our power. So the third point 
that I want you to get down for if you're running on empty. We just need to get to Jesus. And then lastly, in verse 11, it says that we need to wait for Jesus. Many of us become impatient. And in verses 1 through 10, they didn't get what they needed. They saw that the tomb was empty, but they still did not find where Jesus was laid. But in verse 11, uh, the Bible says, but Mary stood without. And this was after the disciples had departed. The disciples came to the sepulcher. They saw that Jesus wasn't there. They saw that the linen was just laying there and that the napkin that covered his head was in another place neatly folded up. And they were okay with that. They decided that they were going to leave. But Mary instead, she decided that she was going to wait at the tomb and still remain there. And she was rewarded for her patiently waiting on the Lord. The Bible tells us they that wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. He, they shall be able to mount up with wings as eagles, uh, run and not be weary, walk and faint not. When we wait on God, our change is guaranteed to come. If we wait patiently for him, he'll come up and he'll show himself mighty and show himself strong on our behalf. So if you're running on empty today, I encourage you to do these four things. Seek after God. Tell somebody about the good news of Jesus. Continue to chase and hunger and thirst after him and wait for him to come through and to equip you and give you everything that you need and more. It says here in verse 11 that Mary, she, in verse 12, she saw the two angels sitting um, on the stone, one on the head and the other at the feet of where Jesus, excuse me, in the sepulcher. They were, one was at the head and one was at the feet and Jesus appeared unto her. All right. So we need to get the source. We need to get just what we need from the Lord. And the only way we can satisfy our emptiness is by us seeking out the Lord. I have here as I quickly come to my conclusion that when we seek after God, we can't look after other people to satisfy the lack or the void that's in our lives. The people came, Matthew, I mean, excuse me, uh, John and Peter and Mary and the other Mary, they came to the sepulcher to get something from the Lord. And when we allow other things to come in and try to satisfy our hunger and our thirst for God and for his righteousness, we find ourselves inadequate. We find ourselves lacking what we need. We need to understand that God is the only source that we have for everything that we need and more. He says in his word that he shall supply all of our needs. I, I, that means that I must get to Jesus because he has everything that I need and more. Um, in Hebrews 12, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That means that he is the beginning beginning and the end of our faith. And so we can't look to anyone else um, to get what we need. Everything that we need, we find in Jesus. He provided everything that they needed uh, at the occasion that they melt him at the sepulcher. Mary needed relief from grief. But the risen Savior gave her a new intimacy with him and, and hope in him because he met her and he met her need in just what she needed. Peter needed forgiveness from sin because he denied Jesus three times just like Jesus told him that he would. Uh, but the risen Savior gave him freedom from the shackles of sin and gave him a supernatural power that he later on would declare uh, the goodness of God to uh, thousands and thousands would come and be saved at the voice and at the words of Peter. John he needed to be identified as someone that was in that was not insignificant he thought he was nobody so he wanted God to elevate him but when the risen Savior came the risen Savior gave him a purpose and a new identity Thomas later on that if you read further into this uh, John chapter 20 Thomas needed to see um, and be able to stick his fingers through the holes in Jesus hand and put his hand into Jesus side where he was pierced um, but the risen Savior God gave Thomas a, re, uh, a reassurance it's a new assurance and confidence that God is true to his word and that he will do just what he says that he would do. And so what I want you to know this morning, that though the tomb is empty, we don't have to uh, live an empty life, that we can go and know that God will satisfy every single need that we have. The tomb was empty for a reason, because that tomb is not where God wants us to lie. We don't have to be born down or burdened by the shackles of this world, but that we can rise again just like he rose on that third day with all power in his hands. What we need in this walk, in our talk, in our lives today, we can find on find in Jesus. We don't have to run on empty. We don't have to run inadequate. We don't have to run ineffectively, but we can tap into the source of this promise today, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and that if he was able to quench every hunger and thirst for them that came to an empty tomb, that means that he can quench and satisfy 
satisfy every hunger and thirst that we have today when he is risen and alive. Uh, they didn't know where he was at, but he was sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding on their behalf for them. We have the promise of being able to read the end of the story. They didn't have the end of the story, but we have it today. And we know our God came and he rose uh, with all power in his hands, both in heaven and in earth. And we have been able to rise again with that same power, that same anointing. I don't want you to run on empty no longer. Make sure that you tap into the one that can satisfy and quench every hunger and thirst for him. Standing on your feet this morning, resting on your feet, running on empty. I know I didn't give you a subject as we started, but running on empty. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. They came running to the sepulcher in a grave, in a cemetery, which tells me that they were looking for something, that they had a need, that they had a desire, that they needed something from the Lord. Their worlds had been turned upside down just three days before. But now their worlds were coming back into focus. Because the Lord had revealed himself to them. To Mary, she waited on God and he revealed himself to her at the sepulcher. But for the other two disciples, John and Peter, he revealed themselves as they was walking to, to another city. What we need from God, he is there to provide it. He may not come when we want him to, but he always comes right on time. I'm here to encourage you today. Sometimes life causes us to be empty. Circumstances in life cause us to be ineffective. We become weary because uh, things are not going the way that we desire for them to go. But I'm here to tell you that even when you find yourself running on empty, that's all you have to do is tap into God and he'll give you and grant you everything that you need and more to give you the strength that you need to continue to run on. As we move forward, we must understand that what we give out is going to cause us to be empty. But every single time we come in here, we should tap in to the fact that this is that we're serving a risen Savior. Lady McCowan said that we should celebrate every Sunday, every day as Resurrection Sunday. We should celebrate it as a day that God rose uh, from the dead with all power and given us everything that we need to rise from our conundrums, from our foolishness, from our ineffectiveness, from our trials, from our tribulations. He's given us the life that we need because he rose on this day. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, God, that you don't allow us to run on empty. You don't have a need for us to be ineffective. But you told us that anything that we need, we can come to you and ask. That we can call upon you. That we can ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. God, we are in desperate need of your strength. We're in desperate need of your encouragement. We're in desperate need of you. So remind us of God daily as we strive to fulfill your purpose and to fulfill your plans for our lives. Help us, God, each and every day to strive, oh God, to remember, God, of the great victory that you gave on this third day, on this first day of the week, God. Every day could be a first day of the week, God. Every day we can look for you to rise on our behalf, that you'll stand for us, oh God, that you'll come, oh God, and be that rock in a weary land. God, help us, oh God, today to remember the greatness, oh God, that you gave us, oh God, by rising, oh God, from the grave. You spent those three days, oh God, conquering death and hell so that we would no longer be uh, bound by death. Death was not the final victor. Death lost its sting. It lost its victory because you came and you conquered death and hell and you rose on the third day just like you said that you would. God, help us to remember your word. Help us to understand, God, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. It is the strength that we need to continue to run on. Thank you for your word. Thank you for rising on the third day. Thank you for coming on the first day of the week that we can celebrate victory and not celebrate your death. God, we celebrate life because you are a risen Savior. You are in the world today. The songwriter said, I know that you're living because you're living with inside of me. Thank you, God, today that you rose. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me newness in life. And thank you for restoring me, God, from where I was. Now bless us, God, on this day. As we continue, continue to celebrate your life, your death, your burial, 
and your resurrection. The story God ended today, it ended with you rising. The defeat that the devil thought that he gave to you. And gave